So everybody wants to live longer, and this article appeared on my computer screen from Medscape, which is a continuing education medical website. It's affiliated with WebMD. So what I wanna do is I wanna go through some of the points that is made by this physician in this article, help you make better sense of it, and, get, and also add in my own little two cents on some of these points. Um, right off the bat, he starts off by saying, choose your ancestors wisely. Yeah, 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 it's, that's cute. You can't do anything about that, so it is what it is. Uh, he does say, never smoke, and I would agree. That's definitely not something you ever wanna do. I would say, don't smoke cigarettes, do not smoke pipes, do not smoke uh, cigars, and do not vape cigarette smoke. It, it is it is horrible and I wouldn't have a problem if it was ever banned. I've seen firsthand up close and personal what happens when people do smoke. It is not pretty. And as for vaping, it is not any safer. I would not vape. I know somebody whose son who was almost uh, killed from vaping, so I would not vape at all. Now, right underneath that, it says maintain a healthy body mass index. Body mass index is your height and your weight divided into each other. And if you're above 30, then you are essentially classified as obese. The problem with body mass index is it doesn't take into consideration muscle mass or people who are very tall, like people who say play professional basketball. Uh, they're going to have high body mass indexes. So it is possible to have a high BMI and a low percent body fat. However, in the general population, that's not necessarily going to be the case. So unless you are an athlete or a weightlifter or something like that, yeah, if your BMI is high, you probably have a high percent body fat and we want to do something to lower that. Right below that, he mentions to maintain a healthy blood pressure. I would agree that's a good idea. Uh, we, we've heard that 120 over 80 is quote unquote normal. Techni and I would imagine that most doctors would be happy if your blood pressure was 120 over 80, um, although technically lower than that would be even healthier. And so if, you, if your blood pressure is on a little on the high side, maybe 130 over 80 or 130 over 90, uh, lowering that is, is, would be a good thing. And one way you could lower blood pressure is even losing a little bit of weight. Even 7% of your body weight loss has been shown to significantly lower blood pressure. Another thing you can do is even add more potassium to your diet, which we'll talk about in a minute. Now, right below that, he also mentions maintaining a low resting heart rate. What is a, a, an average resting heart rate for a so-called healthy person? Anywhere from about 60 beats a minute to about 100 beats a minute. And you can gauge this for yourself if you have like a Fitbit or an Apple Watch or something like that. Wear at the bed for a few days and see what it is over the course of a few days. If you're in that 60 to 80 range, you're considered healthy, although uh, a lower than average resting heart rate, say 60, 55 beats a minute, uh, might even be healthier and so if you can and, and lead to a longer life actually and so if you can do that um, that's a good thing and one way to lower resting heart rate is to get some regular physical exercise why is that exercise affects what's called the parasympathetic nervous system Parasympathetic nervous system is part of your autonomic or automatic nervous system, and it slows everything down, and that's one of the reasons why your heart rate goes lower when you are more physically active. So uh, let me know what your resting heart rate is in the comments below. I'll be curious to uh, check out your comments on this. Now, if we scroll down a little bit further, he does point out that, you know, do not consume sugar, uh, either added or anything. You know, I, I'm, that's a little intense for my taste, so um, you can't avoid added sugar. It's in everything, unless you're just a vegan, a hardcore vegan, in which case you are. But if, you know, a lot of people out there aren't going to be doing that. So what I would say is this. If you're going to be using added sugars, A, I would not add sugars to foods, but sometimes foods do come with sugar added to it, uh, such as you know breakfast cereal, stuff like that. So look for the added sugars on the Nutrition Facts label of the food. If you see 20% or more, it means it's high in added sugars. And that's a rule of thumb. 20% or more means it's high in that nutrient. 5% or low means it's less in that nutrient. You can use that to analyze any, uh, any nutrient on a Nutrition Facts label. So generally when it comes to added sugars, you don't want to eat more than 50 grams a day. And that's not a lot. That's less than two ounces of added sugars per day. So uh, pay attention to that. I'm not worried about the natural sugars that occur naturally in fruits and vegetables. So there, there's no limit on that, but do watch the added sugars because they can increase inflammation. They have zero calories, which can cause weight gain and increased body weight can also increase inflammation and is related to a lot of diseases such as heart disease and cancer and diabetes, et cetera. 
Eat more whole grains. Yeah, I would agree with that because whole grains are uh, a good source of fiber. Fiber has no calories. It fills us up. And fiber is also the food of our healthy gut bacteria. They eat the fiber and they in turn give off compounds like for instance, short chain fatty acids that we in turn can use to stay healthy. So there is a symbiotic relationship between our gut health and our health and fiber can help that. Right below that, he talks about eating more uh, fruits and veggies, fruits and veggies, and 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 tree nuts and peanuts and berries. Uh, he didn't mention really seeds uh, apparently, but I would include seeds in this. Fruits and veggies and beans and seeds contain phytonutrients uh, as well as other nutrients as well, vitamins and minerals uh, that we can use to stay healthy. And if you're not sure what foods have phytonutrients, just look at the colors of the foods: greens, purples, oranges, reds, yellows. If if it is if it has color in it, it has phytonutrients. So fruits and veggies and beans and seeds all have phytonutrients. I think that's a good idea to include them in your diet. I don't necessarily think you have to be using a fiber supplement unless you are not getting enough fiber in your diet. I think that's really an important thing to do. One thing I like to do every day is I usually start my day off with a big fruit and veggie smoothie. I'm actually drinking it right now. I make enough for both breakfast and lunch, um, but I add a lot of stuff to my, my smoothies in the morning. And if you're getting enough fiber, you might not need anything. But again, psyllium he mentions is, is a fine fiber. Psyllium can lower blood sugar levels and blood cholesterol levels. It's pretty inexpensive. Expensive, so if you wanted to add some psyllium to your diet, I have no problem with that. But again, it just depends on how much fiber you're already getting into your diet. In terms of magnesium, which is extremely popular right now in the world of supplements, so rule of thumb, foods that are green contain magnesium, and that's because the green color is due to chlorophyll. At the center of every chlorophyll molecule is magnesium. So if you're eating fruits and veggies and green foods in general, you're probably already getting magnesium, but I think a lot of Americans who are watching me are not getting enough magnesium. So it just depends. If you are getting foods uh, or eating foods that have magnesium, then you might not need a magnesium supplement, but if you're not, then perhaps uh, it might not be a bad idea. If you were gonna consume magnesium supplement. I know a lot of people like to talk about, oh, what's the best form of magnesium? Magnesium is magnesium. The, the companies out there bond it to different things like amino acids, like amino acids, like, like magnesium glycinate and magnesium citrate and magnesium lactate, etc to increase his absorption. But magnesium, no matter what it's bond to, bonded to, is magnesium. And so don't worry about the best form of magnesium. Um, there are some that are more bioavailable absorb, absorption-wise than others. Like for instance, a magnesium glycinate will be more better absorbed than a magnesium oxide. But magnesium oxide can also be absorbed as well. So what I'm saying here is it, look at the foods you're eating first. And if you're saying you're not eating enough green foods, well then say to yourself, why aren't I eating enough green foods? Okay. And then make the judgment call then if you want to add a magnesium supplement to your diet. And if you are going to use a magnesium supplement, I would say use at one time less than 400 milligrams, especially if you've never done it before, because above 400 milligrams, it can have a bit of a laxative effect and that may be uh, a little unpleasant for some people. In terms of vitamin K, he mentions vitamin K here. I'm on the fence with vitamin K because we do, uh, he mentions K2, but there are several different types of K and are kind of interchangeable with each other. And so our, our microbiome make vitamin K, all right? And, and also, uh, so I don't necessarily think we, we need it or not. I'm on the fence when it comes to that. I know some of you are probably using that. And if you are, that's great. Um, it's just not something that I'm convinced everybody has to be taking at right now. Uh, vitamin D, perhaps, uh, I think a lot of people are probably deficient in vitamin D, especially if they go outside and they're all covered up and they're wearing sunscreen when they go out. So maybe a vitamin D might be in order, uh, but get your blood levels checked first. Let's see where you are on a blood test. And if you're at least 30 nanograms per deciliter, most doctors are probably happy with that. Uh, some authorities will recommend 40 and 50 and even above nanograms per deciliter in terms of vitamin D. You know, I would say talk to your doctor if you need a vitamin D supplement. If we scroll down a little bit further, he talks about eating two full meals a day and not snacking. That sounds to me like a reference to intermittent fasting. So intermittent fasting can help people lose weight because at the end of the week, you are eating fewer calories. If you like intermittent fasting, I have no problem with it. I would simply say, don't fast for too long. Don't be like doing 18 hour fasts because at the end of the day, you're probably not gonna be taking enough nutrients or calories in. And sometimes people tell me crazy things about what happens when they don't get enough calories, such as their hair starts to fall out, uh, and, and stuff like that. So be careful with that. Again, in moderation, it's okay if you want to do it a few times a week, but just be careful with extremes at anything. 
don't drink alcohol essentially, or he says do drink alcohol, but not before 5 p.m. and do not binge. Um, I, I would disagree with this. I don't see a reason to drink alcohol at all. I do think it's a poison, and, and I know a lot of people don't like that, but I, I don't see a heart healthy reason to be drinking alcohol. Uh, a lot of people like to talk about how it raises your good HDL cholesterol, but none of the therapies for heart health are about raising HDL. It's all about lowering LDL. The lower the LDL, the better, and alcohol doesn't lower LDL that I've ever read. So and don't, don't start drinking for its so-called health benefits. I'm not convinced of that. But if you are going to drink alcohol, one or two drinks a day, small drinks a day, a couple of ounces, probably not going to hurt anybody, uh, but just be careful with it in, in large amounts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't drink street drugs. We know about that. Don't be a drug addict. <laughs> Nobody, nobody's watching this video shooting heroin, so I'm not worried about that. <laughs> Moving right along. Uh, lifestyle and activity. You know, get enough sleep. Okay. Sleeping, I think, is really a great idea. Uh, just like you reboot your computer every so often, so it refreshes. We reboot ourselves every night when we go to sleep. So absolutely do that. Um, what else is he talking about here? In, enjoy birds and trees. Yeah, get out in wildlife. There does appear to be some evidence that when you do go out in nature, it, that, that the compounds that are released from the trees and the plants, uh, are, when we inhale those compounds, they do appear to have physiological effects in our body, such as lowering blood pressure and easing stress levels. That's really interesting. So I would say get out in nature if you can. I know that may not be possible for everybody, but if you can, do it every once in a while. And then moving down a little bit further, uh, he talks about the, the, the benefits of maintaining uh, social life, having friends and family. Absolutely. Uh, if, you, if you're a hermit, you're not going to live as long probably. But when you have interactions with your friends and your family, your neighbors, etc., cetera, um, that actually is a good thing. Uh, again, it makes you happier. And if it makes you happier, your immune system will be stronger, and which turn could lead to lower risk of diseases and perhaps even a longer life. Um, read more books. Yeah, I'm, I'm good with that. I like, I like reading books on my Kindle, uh, especially the freebie ones. Uh, so I'm all for that. Now, moving down a little bit further, he talks about, uh, you know, taking care of your health. Yeah, that's great. Um, you want to be your best health advocate. He does also mention seeing your dentist on a regular basis. I would agree with that because there is a relationship between the, the health of your teeth and the health of your heart. Heart health and dental health appear to be related to each other. And they've even found, if I remember correctly, the dental bacteria in blood vessel plaque. So brush your teeth, floss your teeth, heck, even scrape your tongue. I'm, I'm a fan of that as well because there's some research that suggests that scraping your tongue can actually raise nitric oxide levels, which you know nitric oxide relaxes the blood vessels uh, and can help, again, lower blood pressure. So um, definitely take care of your oral cavity and it goes a long way to helping your heart health. And then he scrolling down a little bit further, he leaves exercise uh, to the last part, which I don't know why I would put that as number one. He mentions walk two miles every day. I'm not aware of any research that says that you have to walk two miles a day. And I wouldn't start off with it if you hadn't done that before. But I think the reason he's saying two miles a day is because general recommendations for exercise call for getting anywhere from 30 to 60 minutes of aerobic exercise every single day. And if you're walking two miles, that's going to take about 40 minutes if you're walking at a fairly good pace. So if you were doing that, you're kind of in that zone of 30 to 60 minutes. I think that's the reason why he mentioned two miles a day. If you like to swim, great. I, I, again, there's nothing wrong with it, but if you don't have access to a pool, you know, don't beat yourself up over it. It's a fine aerobic exercise, but I'm not aware of any evidence that you have to swim in terms of yoga, he says, you know, learn yoga, but not necessarily in groups. I'm not sure why that is, except for maybe you know, moving germs around in the room or something like that. Um, perhaps yoga can improve muscle, uh, muscle endurance, muscle strength, muscle power. Yoga can improve your balance and even your aerobic fitness. So if you're into yoga, I think it's a great form of exercise, whether you're doing it in a group or you're doing it in your home. He does mention war, you know, working on your balance, like standing on one foot. And if you were going to do that, I wouldn't just stand in the middle of a room on one foot because you could fall. If you were gonna do this, I would stand in a corner because if you're in a corner and you're losing your balance, 
you go to left, you go to right, you're going to bounce into a wall and you'll be much, much more safer. So I think practicing this in a, in a corner is a much better way of doing it than in the middle of a room. And then uh, at, at the end, he does talk about never retire. And I would agree with that. You got to have a reason to get up in the morning. And so if even if you're not working at a payable job, OK, having a reason to get up in the morning is a good idea. Volunteer your time in your in your neighborhood. Uh, learn to help people to read. I think it's a great idea. You volunteer your time or do anything to get up in the morning you know you know it, I think is a great thing uh, when we have goals and we have a reason to get up in the morning it's going to lead to a better quality of life and at the end of the day a better quality of life could even lead to a longer healthier life as well so that's what I have to say about all this I'm going to link to the article below if you want to check it out and uh, that's you know, hopefully this helped make sense of the article a little bit better or at least at least gives you my two cents on some of these bullet points that he listed here so uh, if you have any questions leave them below and until next time everybody definitely take care out there